Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is Nima Fella. I'm Knowledge Management Consultant with the Public Finance and Local Governance Unit at the UNICEF headquarters. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank everyone for your interest in this exciting topic and for taking the time to join the webinar. Uh, in terms of the uh, agendas of today's webinar, after this kind of brief introduction, uh, Maria will talk about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, and then we will have uh, our colleagues from Kenya uh, and Armenia country offices, uh, which they will talk about 15 minutes. And then uh, we will have the pleasure to hear from uh, Jamie Bux from the Urban Institute based in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, and uh, also his reaction to UNICEF's experience. And uh, uh, that would be around 15 minutes. Then we will have uh, uh, the discussion session with Jamie and Nicoletta. That would be around 15 minutes, uh, which uh, will be followed by a Q&A session. So the PowerPoint presentation are uploaded to the PA4C uh, Committee of Practice under the announcements. Uh, and as always, before we start, uh, just quickly go over a few housekeeping items uh, to let you know how you can participate in today's uh, session. Uh, so at uh, any time during the presentation, you can submit your questions and comments by clicking on the text box, the chat box, uh, on your uh, link session screen. And we'll be reviewing them as they come in and uh, will be addressed during the Q&A uh, session at the, after the presentation. Uh, during the Q&A session, if you would like to make a statement, please indicate this by sending a message in the text box. Then we will activate your microphone so that you can interview. And uh, last uh, note, if you are not speaking, please mute your microphone so that the background, background noises are not transmitted during the presentation and discussion. Uh, now, let's uh, start with the webinar and hear from uh, Maria. Okay, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on intergovernmental fiscal transfers within the context of the PF4C webinar series. Um, I will be starting with introducing myself. My name is Maraya Ravain, and I'm a local governance specialist with the Public Finance and Local Governance Unit here at HQ in New York. And today I will be talking about intergovernmental fiscal transfers or IGTs. Okay, because IGTs are um, very closely linked to decentralization, I will start by giving a brief background on decentralization. And normally I could probably fill an entire webinar on this uh, topic alone, and here I've only included a few slides. Uh, but don't worry about this, it's the intention to more fully explore this topic uh, in future webinars. And following an introduction on decentralization, I will present on the basics of uh, IGTs, which will provide a background uh, for the presentations by the Kenya and Armenia country offices. And time allowing, I will conclude these presentations with some final remarks. Now, first, uh, some people may wonder why decentralization is important and specifically how it's relevant to UNICEF. Um, well, decentralization is essentially about who delivers what services. And in decentralized contexts, uh, local governments frequently implement key services for children. Um, this could be, for example, birth registration, education or health services, um, as well as quite frequently WASH-related services. Um, so decentralization is important because it deals with the delivery of key services for children. In defining decentralization, it's really important to remember uh, that this is quite a broad uh, concept and that different definitions uh, and concepts are used uh, among countries. Uh, for example, there's a difference between Francophone countries and Anglophone countries. Um, and also different definitions are used by uh, 
different development partners. Um, so if what you hear here is different from what you've heard in your context, uh, that is possible. Uh, but to ensure that we're all talking about the same thing, I have included a few working definitions. And to me, decentralization is really about the transfer of powers, uh, functions, such as service delivery responsibilities and planning responsibilities, and resources to the subnational level. And ideally, a decentralization reform process involves uh, three aspects, uh, political, administrative, and fiscal aspects. But this is not always implemented at the same time uh, within a country context. Now, political decentralization is essentially about the establishment of different levels of local government. And therefore, political decentralization is often associated with the deepening of democracy. And as such, um, Political decentralization also includes aspects such as local elections, um, accountability mechanisms, as well as participatory mechanisms. Now, once you have established levels of local governments, they also need something to do. They need functions. And I always see administrative decentralization as kind of the software. Uh, political decentralization is the hardware. And then uh, administrative decentralization is the software. So there are three different types of de uh, administrative decentralization. The first type is devolution, and this is the most extensive type of decentralization. In devolution, the central government gives local governments responsibilities, uh, for example, in the area of WASH or in birth re registration. And local governments can then decide how to implement uh, these functions best based on local priorities and local preferences. And in devolution, local governments are accountable to their electorate for the devolved responsibilities. Now, in delegation, local governments implement functions on behalf of the central government, uh, usually accord according to some guidelines. And a key difference with devolution is then that accountability is upwards uh, towards the central government and not so much towards the electorate. Uh, deconcentration is similar to delegation. But it involves the transfer of functions to line departments. Um, so in this case, it's not so much about local governments. And um, accountability is also upwards. Um, for example, uh, a deconcentration could be when a, a Ministry of Health uh, deconcentrates a function to a, uh, a district health department. Now, I mentioned these three types because when sector colleagues or even colleagues when, within UNICEF are talking about decentralization, often they are talking about deconcentration, whereas people uh, with a government's governance background uh, usually refer to devolution and delegation as decentralization. Finally, in order to effectively implement their functions, uh, local governments also need funds. And uh, usually, they have three different uh, funding uh, types. Uh, first, uh, local governments have their own revenues through local fees and fines and taxes. And local governments uh, can usually borrow, uh, though this is not always the case in all contexts. And then finally, uh, local governments uh, receive intergovernmental fiscal transfers, which is the topic of our webinar today. So why are IGTs important, and why are IGTs important to UNICEF? Uh, well, because IGTs constitute as much as 80% of government re local government revenues. Um, also, IGTs have important implications for geographical equity. And a failing IGT system can therefore create major bottlenecks in the delivery of key services for, ch for children. So IGTs can really be seen as a precondition in achieving children's rights on a local level. What are IGTs? Well, essentially, ITTs refer to the transfer of money from the central government to local governments, or from one level of local government to the other level, for example, from province to district. Um, it's important to remember that IGTs are not uh, one-off transfers. Rather, it's cyclical. 
and uh, IGTs can include various kinds of financing instruments such as grants, subsidies, as well as tax sharing arrangements. And uh, a country will likely also use various different kinds of transfers to local governments, each with their own uh, objective. In understanding a transfer system, uh, five questions are important. The first question is how IGTs are anchored within the legal framework. In some countries, broad parameters are set out within the constitution, and this is, for example, the case in Kenya, and I think uh, Joanne will talk more about this in her presentation. And then uh, specific fiscal acts may provide further details. So if you want to know more about IGTs within your specific country context, a first step would be to look up this uh, legal framework. A second question is how the central government decides on the total pool to be distributed to local governments. Uh, this is also referred to as the vertical pool, and basically there are three options. It can be rule-based, uh, for example, um, um, it could be a fixed percentage of the national budget. It can be an ad hoc decision by uh, the president or by parliament. Uh, for example, when I worked in Lesotho, every year the Minister of Finance would make uh, the budget announcement for the next year and would mention how much funds would be allocated to local governments or it can be based on an estimate of local government expenditures, um, which in reality may be quite difficult to calculate. So uh, what should be kept in mind is that the matter in which the vertical pool is decided um, has implications for local govern government budget predictability. So if it's an ad hoc decision, um, that may result in fluctuations from year to year, which may create problems for local government uh, planning on the long term. Also, uh, the transfer pool, irrespective of the type, is almost never decided based on uh, precise calculations of needs, but rather a reflection of, for example, fiscal space. The third question is in regard to the objective of the transfer, and there are more or less four options. Um, the objective can address a vertical imbalance. Um, that means that almost no local government has enough revenues to cover all their costs. So the objective of the IGT may be to fill that gap. Um, it can be to address a horizontal imbalance. A horizontal imbalance is caused by differences in the revenue base between local governments. For example, a local government in a middle-class urban area may be able to collect much more revenues than a local government in a poor uh, rural area. So because of uh, existing inequalities in many developing countries, equalization is quite often one of the most important objectives of IGTs. And and as you will hear from the Kenya and Armenia country offices, it is also an issue that UNICEF has engaged in. Uh, the third objective could be to address externalities or spillovers. Uh, this is the idea that local governments may have um, a disincentive to invest on a certain service uh, because it we would require a similar investment from lo other local governments as well. Um, uh, just a brief example could be that um, uh, local government investment on mosquito control may be limited if uh, neighboring local governments don't invest on mos mosquito control. So the objective is then to ensure a certain level of service delivery uh, through a transfer. A final objective could be to promote uh, national priorities, especially if it's considered a high priority by the central government, uh, but a low priority by local governments. And this is an area that uh, UNICEF Moldova has been uh, working on in the past. The fourth question uh, is on how the transfer pool is distributed among um, uh, among local governments, uh, and this is also referred to as the horizontal pool. Again, the matter in which this is done uh, can have important equity uh, implications. 
It can be based on an ad hoc decision or central local negotiations, um, which not always guarantees the most equitable outcome as it can then be rather a reflection of uh, political considerations um, than equity. A more transparent would be a formula-based approach. A formula includes uh, different variables, for example, population size or the number of children, as well as geographical considerations. Uh, but its impacts on equity and children depends largely on the variables that are chosen, as well as the weight that they are given. It can also be based on a share of a national tax uh, in which each local government receives an amount based on collection of that tax uh, within their boundaries. And finally, it can be based on uh, reimbursement of specific costs, for example, of uh, administrative costs and the costs of the delivery of specific services. The final question uh, relates to the type of transfers. Uh, roughly, transfers can be divided in general purpose transfers and conditional transfers. General purpose transfers allow for local discretion, and this is um, very much in line with a devolution model. Either it is completely discretionary or in the form of block grants uh, in which funds have to be spent on a specific area, such as health or education, uh, but within, uh, within that area, the funds are discretionary. Uh, conditional grants are for specific purposes, and they are usually linked to specific guidelines as well, as well as um, uh, inputs or uh, certain outputs to be achieved by local governments. Uh, conditional grants have, um, or they can have a matching component where the local government needs to match the transfer with their own funds, and this again can have um, equity implications. Now, to wrap it up, um, it is important to keep in mind uh, that the objective of the transfer and the manner in which the transfer is distributed and the type of transfer, um, they should be linked. Um, and also, formula-based and general purpose transfers are often associated with countries favoring a devolution model, whereas ad hoc and cost reimbursement models are generally favored by countries with a delegation model. So uh, before going into um, uh, the case studies, I just want to mention that these case studies are part of a techno tech technical note on intergovernmental uh, fiscal transfers, which will be finalized by the end of the month. And in the technical note, there are two additional case studies by the China and Moldova country offices. Um, so I hope you'll find time um, to look at this technical note. So, now over to Joanne Bosworth for her presentation on the work done in Kenya. Uh, thank you. So let me upload the presentation Kenya. John, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. John, are you there? Okay, I guess uh, John is not there. Can we start with uh, Armenia? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Arthur, are you there? Can you hear us? Okay, great. So I will upload your uh, presentation.
Okay, can I start? Can you hear me? Yes, and you can take over as presenters and uh, move forward. Mm -hmm. I took it over, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll be presenting um, a short case uh, describing our engagement in intergovernmental fiscal transfers. Uh, so basically, a very brief country context which will be helpful for the colleagues to understand uh, uh, some details of the process. So back in 1996, uh, the country uh, started the big uh, public administration reform as a result of which a uh, two-tier system of subnational governance uh, was established. Uh, two-tier meaning one level was uh, municipalities, the second was uh, uh, regions. Um, and municipalities, referring to Maria's present presentation, is uh, largely a devolution model, so they have a large uh, responsibilities in the areas of health, education, uh, and waste management, for example, whereas the regions also have some uh, considerable authorities in relation to services, uh, social social sector services, but uh, they are more uh, the concentrated model, working in a the, the concentrated model uh, modality. Uh, and since then, uh, three types of intergovernmental fiscal transfers uh, were established by the government. Uh, the first one is equalization transfer. Uh, we also apply uh, subventions and subsidies as specific types of uh, transfers for municipalities. Just to mention that uh, equalization alone uh, has a unique and critical role. So basically, almost... Uh, 56% of local budgets uh, are covered uh, through equalization. So that's the major revenue source for uh, municipalities. And in Armenia, the system is quite fragmented and uh, borrowing is, uh, you can hear, rarely seen the municipalities uh, uh, using uh, that specific modality and taxation is also quite, uh, is not that big. So equalization is one of the biggest re revenue sources for, for municipalities. Um, uh, in a nutshell, uh, uh, key problems that we've been facing, uh, we've been facing in Armenia uh, is that, um, despite the fact that we use uh, a formula which is quite a transparent manner, and municipalities can easily calculate what kind of um, uh, the the amount that the, they will receive, and there is no ad hoc decision. But still, it has some serious uh, limitations. Uh, it, it basically considers uh, local fiscal capacity, the revenue side, but it does not differentiate between the various financial needs uh, the municipalities have. Uh, so, for example, if the two municipalities of, uh, of, of approximate, with approximately the same revenue base, they might have different uh, financial needs, uh, meaning financial expenditure lines. So one may have more services than another, and this is not uh, taken into consideration uh, in the law that regulates uh, financial equalization. Uh, the second problem, and it refers to another type of transfer, is the, uh, the capital subvention. So this is usually the source to finance uh, municipal services, the capital services, the newly established uh, services. And there we have another problem. It is partially regulated. And it's, uh, there is no uh, a total pool uh, predecided. Uh, uh, and the difference with equalization, for example, is that for equalization, uh, uh, there is a fixed percentage assigned. Uh, the, that's the 4% of the consolidated budget that should go normally uh, to municipalities. While for the capital subventions, there is no a capital for pool. So municipalities cannot basically predict what will be the overall available for them to design their um, services, including expansion of the existing and creation of the new services. Uh, referring to the regional level, which is also quite important, as uh, I've mentioned, they are, uh, they are managing a number of uh, uh, important child-focused uh, services. Um, they are these, these are the concentrated bodies, and they have uh, specific uh, deliver, uh, service delivery responsibilities, but they have a marginal control over the budget, meaning that the state directly transfers the money through the Treasury Department to the respective service unit, which means that the whole concept of regional planning is quite artificial. So the regional authorities cannot properly 
plan uh, their um, uh, the expansion of their services, the creation of the new ones. Just to mention, just to bring an example, that the schools are at the discretion of regions, but uh, the planning for education is very is very ad hoc and and, and is very artificial because uh, uh, because uh, there is no there is no um, budgeting control. So in a nutshell, these are the key problems that uh, the system currently faces. Uh, so why why did we engage in the process? And I'll be very frank. Uh, so we did not plan uh, to engage in the intergovernmental fiscal trust for uh, areas. So it appeared uh, as a necessity. But our diagnosis was at the time that these issues that I was referring before uh, combined uh, uh, considerably affect the subnational governance system. And in many respects, they are not only predetermined the quality of the services provided to children, but in most of the cases, they, uh, they decide on the existence of uh, basic public services. And that explicitly, that this, this explicitly refers to the services for disadvantaged groups, uh, including uh, children. So that's the key problem. And uh, for us, it's, it's quite, an, uh, quite an important area. Uh, and that's why we decided uh, to engage. But as I said, uh, there was no a direct decision to to start the engagement in the intergovernmental fiscal tra transfers. Um, we started our engagement from the assessment, um, uh, uh, and basically one of the major pieces uh, pieces uh, that we produced was the public finance management system uh, in Armenia document that clearly uh, highlights uh, the problems, the problems and the needs. Uh, uh, and, then, and it clearly outlines the necessity to engage in the in the in the process. Um, another process that we were implementing simultaneously was the big uh, social protection reform, which entails the establishment of the integrated social service system. And one of the layers of that system was uh, so-called local social planning, which is an approach that, uh, in addition to sectoral planning. Uh, also uh, uh, proposes uh, to look into the issues of uh, vulnerable groups of population, including children. So it's an innovative approach that also uh, reveals uh, the key specific problems that children face. Uh, and in doing that, we realized that uh, in order for this approach to be fully institutionally taken by the government, the necessary funding uh, pool is required. And that's where we started our collaboration with the um, World Bank uh, team, uh, which simultaneously worked a lot on the transformation of uh, a typical World Bank uh, baby, a uh, social investment fund, which uh, was used to support various uh, social infrastructure in municipalities. And uh, two years ago, World Bank started the process of transformation of, uh, of the uh, social investment fund into a territorial development fund. So the territorial development fund is uh, another mechanism uh, that uh, stipulates, uh, uh, that assumes the creation of a pool of money, predictable money, for municipalities and regions uh, to finance their various uh, uh, social initiatives, whether new or a expansion of the, ex could be also uh, related to the expansion of these existing services. But in a way, it, um, it, 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 um, it will serve as a capital subvention fund. So with a different title, but uh, the way it is designed and the way it is, uh, it will be working, uh, more, uh, correspond to the definition of, of a capital uh, subvention institute. And the another um, area of engagement, uh, it's completely different, and it relates to the creation of uh, childcare services at local level, and it's also quite new for us. But uh, there, we think that the possible way will be um, a, a delegated model where the where the municipalities will start uh, designing their new services in accordance to the to the to the standards defined uh, by the state. Uh, which means that another financing instrument uh, can be applied there. So neither equalization nor subvention or su su subsidy is not the proper instrument to support uh, this specific um, pillar. Uh, coming back to, to the equalization, um, I, I need to say that uh, 
it was not a UNICEF-led process. So there were usual uh, suspects, uh, IFIs, and later on Council of Europe who took the initiative uh, with the technical partners with whom we also closely cooperate, community finance officers. Uh, so the whole idea of revising uh, financial equalization uh, is based on the introduction of so-called adec budget adequacy principle, uh, meaning that um, uh, there are several several new variables uh, introduced, including the pop proper population breakdown, including the number of children. So it considers the geographic fragmentation that uh, various municipalities have. So one may consist of one settlement, the others may consist of several settlements, meaning that they also bring an additional uh, fine, uh, expenditures uh, for that specific municipality. Uh, and other variables, just to mention, include the distance from the capital and the regional center, the attitude above sea level, and other specific variables that better portray the specific um, uh, expenditure uh, expenditure needs of, of, of municipalities. So the in general, the purpose of this new formula is to mitigate uh, the budget gap between vulnerable municipalities. Uh, in another way, it's, it, it serves the purpose of horizontal uh, equalization. Uh, it addresses the specific needs of children. And it could be further strengthened uh, by enabling uh, the scope and the quality of existing services. So, in terms of uh, results, uh, I need to admit that we don't have an impact results yet, but we have a number of uh, system level uh, results, which, which are expected, uh, which will be shortly uh, translated into the impact level. So, the local planning as an approach has been institutionally taken by the government. The newly proposed formula, the one that I was referring to, uh, was uh, 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 is presented to the parliament, and there the children is uh, children uh, are presented as one of the variables uh, with a relative weight of 10 percent. So the number of children directly uh, influences the allocation of of that given municipality will have received. And the social investment fund, uh, the, the one that uh, that appeared as a result of the World Bank's uh, initiative, uh, now has been officially approved, and it started this, uh, its new uh, operations with the first uh, pool of money available for the social and economic initiatives of, of municipalities. Um, in terms of lessons, uh, I need to say that, uh, yes, it was uh, unexpected. Uh, I'm repeating the idea that we did not plan the engagement. Uh, we decided to go integrated, meaning that uh, uh, every opportunity that will, uh, every type of intergovernmental transfer is interesting for us, and we decided not to limit our engagement in the with the one because they have different purposes and uh, different implications for the child related services i think the critical aspect uh, the critical factor there is a closer cooperation with uh, various uh, partners including ministry of finance like ministries and the technical partners who work with us and who at the same time were engaged in the process of revising the intergovernmental fiscal transfers. And the key one is there, I think, the World Bank, with whom we closely cooperate uh, regarding the, uh, regarding integra integrated, uh, uh, intergovernmental uh, fiscal transfers. Um, I think uh, it's very important to note that um, because it's highly political uh, process, uh, for us, it was very important to see the political momentum. Just to mention that the issue of revising financial equalization was uh, in the agenda of the government for the last, uh, I don't know, five, six, if not seven years. But so the political momentum is quite important. Uh, another trigger for that momentum to happen was also the financial austerity, so which additionally triggers uh, the need for 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 more uh, effective uh, solutions and it opened the door for the new policies but in general it's a very long process and we experienced the, the political dif uh, difficulties uh, uh, during the process um, so again uh, it was quite a new area for engagement and i think uh, uh, it was possible for us to engage because we have a credibility in other areas 
and we decided deliberately not to take a leading role in the process because the, the governmental fiscal transfers uh, deal not only with children but deal with uh, uh, all, ty all categories of population and all type of services delivered by municipalities and the local uh, and subnational uh, uh, authorities. That's why we have our specific niche, but uh, and we decided to partner with the uh, partner with the usual suspects and not take the leading role in the, during the process. I think um, one of the key lessons for us is that uh, if we uh, if the need for intergovernmental fiscal transfers is clear, if the need for engagement is clear from the onset. I think the, the planning the, of the engagement is much more efficient because we started our engagement quite late. So it was the process when we created the new tool, the new planning system, and then it appeared uh, that there is a problem. So we need to also think about the proper uh, uh, financial envelope for the newly created planning uh, document. Um, and there is another interesting aspect that I think will be useful for colleagues to know is that um, um, there is a ball game shift in this process. So uh, when we engage in the intergovernmental fiscal transfers, we realize that our messages uh, somehow deviate from the messages of our usual and traditional uh, partners because uh, they, 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 the point of, uh, for example, supporting the subnational governance does not necessarily mean that the given by ministry uh, will support it. So in most of the cases, the line ministries uh, lose some financial power over the funds, uh, which is quite difficult uh, for them to digest. So I mean, we need to have a clear understanding of the risk uh, uh, when advocating for the intergovernmental fiscal transfers. So I think uh, I'm done, and I'll be happy to answer any any question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Sorry. Uh, can you can you hear me? Uh, John, are you there? Say again. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Finally. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you can take over as presenter to uh, move forward the I just go here. Okay. You have your presentation. Thanks. Okay, so uh, I think, um, thank you very much uh, for your patience. I hope you can all hear me now. Um, I'm going to uh, give the case, case study of Kenya Country Office work on intergovernmental fiscal transfers. This is largely work that that can work that took place in 2011 and 2012 right so I'll just uh, briefly talk a little bit about the the context of this work um, Kenya has a history of high levels of inequality and marginalization of, of certain regions um, and there are large uh, disparities in, in children's rights and service service delivery. So uh, in August 2010, um, Kenya passed a new, adopted a new constitution, and um, this the, a key focus of the constitution is actually starting to address some of this historical inequality. Um, so within the constitution, there were a number of important aspects related to the financing of devolved services. And these included um, uh, uh, 
an allocation of at least 15% of national revenues to counties to be used for financing devolved services, the establishment of a commission for revenue allocation, uh, which would be responsible for developing a revenue allocation formula to determine the vertical and the horizontal allocation of resources between the different counties. Um, it gives provision for counties to raise their own local revenues and it provides for an equalization fund which is, uh, has an explicit purpose of uh, investing in social infrastructure in historically marginalized counties. So this was really a historic opportunity for Kenya to make service provision more equitable and more locally responsive. So why did Kenya Country Office engage in the debate around the intergovernmental fiscal transfers? Well, firstly, uh, the, the, the major factor actually was that we recognize the significance of the devolution process to the equitable realization of children's rights. The services that are being devolved uh, include all of the health services below referral level, uh, nutrition services, rural water and sanitation, early childhood development and childcare, uh, and also some other critical functions are, are shared between the national and the county government. Um, at the time that we started to engage in this debate, many of the other agencies were keen to support devolution, um, but were not necessarily focusing on the so social services angle. So we saw that UNICEF had a, a bit of a niche role to play in advocating around uh, social services. Um, and then the third element of uh, why the, the country office decided to engage was that um, we did consider that we had some uh, technical advice and experience. We had been engaging in uh, budget-related processes um, for a number of years. So uh, that was also one of the factors. Um, just briefly to, to share with you uh, our analysis of uh, child deprivations. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the map on, on the left of the slide, this highlights the, the tremendous disparities in, in children's outcomes. Um, and the counties, there are 47 counties under the new devolved system. Um, about uh, 18 or 19 of those actually have very high levels of child deprivation, which are the counties that are marked in red on the map. So uh, in terms of thinking about what would be UNICEF's inputs to this process, uh, there were really five sort of five stages to, to what was done. Um, first of all, an equity analysis was conducted, which really um, highlighted some of these uh, underlying challenges in terms of uh, unequal capacities, uh, unequal access to uh, health services and also highlighted um, the, the different levels of likely revenue generation potential for the different counties and specifically suggested that those counties which, um, which had higher levels of child deprivation were also those that had lower capacities overall and were likely to have lower capacities to raise revenues. Um, there were also, because of the um, remoteness of some of those counties, there are also issues about differences in, in the unit costs. So um, based, on, based on that, it was decided to um, prepare a technical brief on the issues of devolution, equity and revenue allocation, um, which uh, the current situation in terms of service outcome, but also looked at some international experiences, comparative experiences, and some potential factors to be considered in the revenue allocation formula. Uh, we then undertook some advocacy and dialogue with the Commission for Revenue Allocation uh, on the basis of that technical brief, um, and this really highlighted to them some of the issues around equity um, and the potential of the revenue allocation formula itself to address equity. 
Uh, you remember that I referred to an equalization fund, which has a, an explicit equity focus and only goes to the most marginalized counties. But the, um, the aim of this presentation and advocacy with the Commission of Revenue Allocation was to highlight that the, the revenue allocation formula itself could also play a major role in terms of um, rectifying some of the, um, you know, the historical inequalities and something of a redistributive role. Um, following on from that, uh, some uh, we, we worked with some uh, other UN agencies, UNDP and UN Women in particular, were also concerned to look at um, the, the revenue allocation formula and to highlight some of the equity issues around it. So there was a, uh, there was a consultation period around the revenue allocation formula and we facilitated a, a joint workshop which again highlighted some of the equity issues. Um, following on from that workshop, it was determined that there was a need to uh, give greater weight to redistribution within the formula, and UNICEF provided support in um, considering different ways to revise the formula. Um, so, in order, we can sort of show uh, a, a, a bit of an impact from this. Of course, it's it's an impact of, of uh, UNICEF's inputs uh, along with the inputs of other agencies. So it's not something that we claim is entirely down to UNICEF, um, but um, we do think that we um, at least made a contribution to this process. Uh, the first formula that was developed by the Commission for Revenue Allocation um, and floated in early 2012, uh, included five criteria and gave the weights as are set out on this slide. So there was a high weighting to population. Um, there was uh, a 20% uh, equal share. There was a 12% for poverty, which um, was based on a headcount measure of poverty and gives more to counties with higher proportions of poor people. And there was also um, a smaller element for um, land area and a small element for fiscal discipline at that stage. Following um, the interventions that uh, I've described um, and further subnational con consultations, the CRA actually revised its proposed formula and decided to use the poverty gap as its measure of poverty. So this really gave uh, more weight to poverty um, and also greater weight to the counties that were further behind. So the, the, the weight given to poverty was increased to 20% and they also decided to use um, poverty gap. Um, the resulting formula actually significantly altered the level of resources that were slated to go to the most deprived counties and it, that resulted in increased resources for many of the counties with higher levels of child deprivation. Based on um, a very rough uh, calculation, the cumulative benefit of that change in terms of resources was in, in the region of $67 million going to the 12 counties with the highest levels of child deprivation. And this chart really shows that the blue lines are what was um, provided for in the original CRA formula. These, the, the 12 counties here are mostly the ones that were highlighted in, in red on the map that was showed. And then the, the red lines is the amount that was um, provided to those counties following the revision. So some counties lost a little bit um, because the change wasn't only to the poverty formula. That there were also changes to the weights given to um, population and the basic equal share. So not all counties benefited under um, the change, but the cumulative benefit was, was quite significant. Um, additional impact really for in terms of UNICEF was that there, there was greater recognition within this process of UNICEF as an agency that could contribute on these issues of governance and public financial management. It also um, in the process, working on, on devolution, preparing the brief and engaging with some of the other actors around devolution, contributed to our internal learning on devolution and was one of the basis for uh, the 
Kenya country office devolution strategy, which in turn significantly informed the new country program. Um, and it's also led on to, it's sort of paved the way for work, sector work actually, for example, in health, looking at marginal budgeting for bottlenecks in those counties which uh, are more deprived and where there are now more resources to work uh, for children. Some of the lessons learned and some of the challenges included um, the enabling factors that enabled us to really participate in this was the very significant window of opportunity around the establishment of devolved governance. Um, UNICEF's internal refocus on, on equity, uh, which occurred at exactly the same time, really gave additional impetus to being uh, able to work on this agenda. Um, UNICEF and UN staff capacity and the relationships that had already been developed with, with government through, um, through the work on uh, social budgeting uh, was, was a, an important enabling factor and particularly the partnership with UNDP on this issue. Um, another enabling factor was, in hindsight we can see this, that the formula was actually developed before the new counties existed. So there wasn't a lot of um, political discussion around the equity basis for the formula um, uh, because there, were no, there was um, no really strong political constituency uh, at the county level at the time that this formula was developed. Some of the challenges that uh, existed at the time that there, although there was some recognition of um, UNICEF's work in this area, it was also, I think it's fair to say, there was also some um, hesitation really about UNICEF's legitimacy to engage um, by some of the partners and that this really has not at the moment been sustained so it, it's something of a one-off, I have to say. Um, also, on a more practical note, there was, because these counties didn't exist before, um, there was a lack of good disaggregated data at the time to, to use for developing the formula. But we can just briefly also reflect on what has happened since the transition to devolution. So this, the work that I'm referring to took place in 2011-2012. In 2013, mm -hmm. The county governments were elected for the first time and the functions which had been envisaged to be transferred over um, uh, quite a long time period were actually tr pretty much transferred wholesale almost at, at the outset. The expenditure of national government has not fallen, um, so all the expenditure that is taking place at county level is in effect additional public expenditure. We now know, after sort of two years in, that county spending on service delivery and equity areas is actually now significantly below what was happening at pre at, uh, prior to devolution. And particularly health spending is around 80% of what was occurring before devolution. Urban counties have been particularly disadvantaged and there have been significant challenges in budgeting and budget execution at county level so UNICEF is now really focusing on undertaking budget analysis and focusing on strengthening accountability. Some of the reasons for these challenges was actually possibly because the, the resulting formula was very heavily redistributive. And um, this me meant that while some of the most marginalized counties had a lot of spare funds, that they they had very low capacity in service delivery, so they had a lot of spare funds that they could they could expend. However, those counties which were better served in historically actually inherited very high staff costs and ended up not having a lot of money to additional money to spend on development, and that particularly applied to the urban counties. Um, in 2014, the formula was revised, reflecting some of these experiences, and the poverty, the weight of the poverty measure has been reduced slightly and has been compensated by uh, an additional measure to help those counties that have high inherited staff costs um, uh, address, cater for those, cater for those staff costs. Um, it's an ongoing debate in Kenya, and um, 
I think it's one that uh, in which UNICEF and the UN agencies uh, really plan to stay engaged because it has such a significant bearing on the situation of services for children. So that's the end of my presentation for today. Um, thank you very much. Uh, many thanks, John. Uh, we have received a couple of questions, but we're going to address them and answer during the Q&A session. Now we directly move to uh, Jamie's presentation. Jamie, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? So let me uh, upload your presentation. And Okay, so uh, I guess you can take over as a presenter. All right. All right. Okay. I, I believe it's all set. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this webinar. Uh, I'll try to keep my comments a, a bit brief. Um, first, two sentences about myself. I'm a senior associate at the Urban Institute uh, in Washington, D.C. I've been working on decentralization uh, and local governance issues around the world for about 15 years and in 20 countries now. Um, and within decentralization, uh, broadly, I've probably spent um, most of my energy and efforts on the design of intergovernmental transfers in Africa, Asia, former Soviet republics. Um, and so it's a, a great to contribute a little bit. What I thought I would do um, is, is give some very broad ideas of what could go wrong with intergovernmental transfers. And the, the country presentations that were made prior already highlight some of the issues, and I'll try to link where I can. Um, but before jumping into those details, I would like to um, just take one, one step back uh, what are we trying to achieve with these grants? And, and Mariah's presentation already touched upon this. Um, of course, we're trying to fund pro-poor or, or pro-child services at the local level, and all these services, virtually all these services, take place at the local level. And, and therefore, um, there are really three things that need to happen. Um, the first is that uh, we need to make sure that adequate resources flow down to the local level. Um, the second thing that needs to happen is that the resources that get to the local level need to dis be distributed equitably uh, and efficiently across the national territory. And then third, um, at the local level, the right institutions need to be in place to, to transform the inputs, the resources that we put there into outcomes and or outputs and outcomes. Um, in other words, public services that are uh, targeted at the at the right recipients. Um, so again, the resources need to flow down. We refer to that as vertical allocation. Then we need to distribute those resources equitably across national territory. And then at the local level, the resources need to be put to good use. Um, sounds simple enough. And this, this is true for devolved countries, countries with elected local governments. Uh, this is also true for deconcentrated countries. Uh, and in reality, most countries are actually hybrids where there is some kind of combination of devolution and deconcentration or even centralized service delivery. Um, and if we take the specific example of uh, devolved countries, then and we realize that in, in many countries where we work, 80 to 90 percent of local spending is funded by intergovernmental transfers. Um, and obviously, the, the how we uh, design our transfer systems and how we implement them becomes very important. Uh, in any design of a transfer system, we need to take five basic steps. Uh, and I've, I've grouped them. Um, in the same three uh, elements that, that I, I mentioned earlier. The first is we need to determine the exact objective of the transfer and then make sure that we determine the size of the fund to make sure we have adequate funding. Uh, and then the third step we need to do, which is together, is the, the vertical allocation of resource issue. Uh, the, the third step is to determine the horizontal allocation. And, and that is actually the, the part of the transfer design that often takes uh, gets the most interest. What is the formula? Which variables go in there? Um, 
both Arthur as well as Joanna talked a lot about um, the formulas in, in their cases. Um, so it's, of course, the, uh, the design of the formula matters, but very much also the implementation matters. Um, the fourth step in the design of a, a good transfer is uh, to consider the conditionalities of the grant. The fifth element is the implementation, administration, and monitoring. Um, I sometimes joke that step one through four can be done in a two-week mission. Step five will take two decades. Um, now, where, can, where do things go wrong? When I started thinking about this, um, I realized actually things go wrong at each of the three phases of a of the intergovernmental system. First, um, many countries have major problems with the overall design or the vertical allocation of resources. Things can go wrong, uh, secondly, with uh, during the horizontal allocation of resources. And um, equally, things often go wrong once resources reach the local level um, uh, and, and they're not effectively or efficiently used uh, to, to, be, uh, to deliver local services for the people that we intend them for. So let me go through, through those three buckets of problems. Um, if I look at uh, UNICEF's global experience, uh, one of the problems I see a lot is uh, that there are uh, projectized uh, grants schemes. Either they're sectorally projectized or they're kind of donor supported and as a result projectized that are outside of the regular local government system. Um, of course, the, uh, uh, what we're facing is a bit of a clash sometimes between uh, sectoral experts or sectoral desires and um, those, who, uh, those of us who work on local governance systems throughout. So there, a country may have a specific grant system, um, but then there is a need to accomplish or uh, something sector specific or a donor may have a specific objective and that results in the, a projectized design. Um, so uh, one example uh, might be that, for example, Joanne mentioned that health, there, there's this constraint and concern in Kenya about health not being funded adequately. So actually there's a major push within the health sector to provide earmark transfers to counties in Kenya right now, um, outside the design of what the Constitution says. So these things happen quite a bit. Um, it's also very common for a sector to, for example, with donor funding, provide top-up grants to a limited number of jurisdictions, um, again, outside of what would reg be the regular transfer system. Uh, a second common problem I, I see a lot uh, is that the size of a grant pool is not linked or inadequate for its intended purpose. Um, a government wants to achieve something, uh, states its objectives, um, but then the money is not available. Uh, if we do not link the size of the grant pool to the expenditure requirement, uh, this obviously leads to underfunding and often to disillusionment with decentralization. So this is a really a major problem. Uh, one cautionary note there is we should be very careful to suggest that local governments should use their own sources for something we care about a lot. Um, let me give you a small example. We're currently working with a um, sanitation NGO, and they are trying to increase uh, local government spending from own sources on sanitation. One of the problems they are facing is uh, that uh, because sanitation is good, uh, local governments should be spending their own money on this. Uh, however, local politicians who have to be elected don't necessarily uh, see the world the same way. Local politicians should be spending their own tax revenues on local priorities, not necessarily on the priorities that are seen by either the central government or local government. So there's a, uh, we, we should not, uh, we should be very careful to assume that local governments should use their own revenue for our priorities. Um, and thus, if we want local governments to do something, we need to make sure we give them adequate funding through the transfer system. Uh, <clears throat> a third problem uh, with the vertical allocation of grant resources uh, is uh, a challenge of tunnel vision. 
Sometimes we end up trying to design the perfect grant scheme while we're ignoring all other grants and even other very relevant non-devolved funding streams. Um, as I mentioned earlier, many countries are not strictly devolved or deconcentrated. And so we may come up with a solution, and the World Bank solution may be a, a social action fund or a territorial development fund or, or something, um, but actually the solution may not be necessarily be the prob uh, solving the problem we're trying to solve. For example, if the main problem in service delivery is inequitable allocation of salaries, then a grant that provides funding for operation and maintenance is not necessarily going to fix that problem. So we have to be very careful uh, and analyze critically if we are providing the funding that fixes the service delivery problem. Um, now, this, the second bucket of problems are problems with horizontal allocation of grant resources. And as I mentioned earlier, these are the ones that um, get most attention, I think. Um, this is These are questions about whether or not to use a formula and, and the design of the formula. Um, of course, the first problem is that um, there are political and institutional forces that don't like formula-based allocations. Um, Joanne, in her presentation, mentioned that one of the reasons there wasn't that much political pushback was because the counties did not exist when the initial formula was designed. Um, but in reality, any introduction of a formula or change of a formula will cause winners and losers, and it is, a, as a result, a very political process. Um, and so even just introducing a formula can be extremely political. Um, of course, budget officials in the Ministry of Finance may or may not resist the introduction to a formula because it takes their discretionary power away to allocate resources um, in a way that they find practical. Uh, a second common problem, which I think you will recognize, is the uh, simply that a formula, an allocation formula, may be poorly designed and it may be inefficient or inequitable. Um, I don't want to go right now through um, the problems in great detail. I've attached in the slides, which I won't present, a few bad practices. Um, uh, suffice it to say at this stage that sometimes the problems in allocation formulas are due to ignorance and sometimes due to malice or politics. Um, but there are many, many formulas being used around the world, uh, Malawi, Cambodia come to mind, where the allocation formulas are, from a technical point of view, patently bad, um, and are not actually putting the resources where, uh, where they're needed the most, um, and where they're fund, where, where the formula appropriately funds, um, uh, local services to the people that we want to fund. Uh, a, a third challenge we see with the horizontal allocation of grant resources is the lack of transition arrangements to new, a new allocation formula. And again, Kenya is a good example. Kenya's decentralization was very much pushed for, uh, due to uh, specific political processes more than service delivery processes. And, and as Joanna mentioned, uh, as a result, we saw a drop in health spending as a result of the decentralization reform, um, simply because there were no transition arrangements put in place. Um, now, luckily, Indonesia had this similar drop in service delivery spending once they shifted to decentralization, uh, and in the 10, 10, 12 years since then, or years since then by now, um, service delivery has picked up. So it is a transition problem, but it's a problem they could have planned for. Now. As part of the problems in horizontal allocation of resources, the next three bullets actually receive probably the least attention and insufficient attention. They're typically, uh, they're pretty technical issues, but and they're typically overlooked. Um, but ultimately, um, without addressing them, uh, again, resources will not go to where they're needed. Um, a very, very common issue is that an allocation formula may be put in place officially, but simply not applied during the budget formulation process. Um, and this is true both for government resources. This is equally true for many social action funds, uh, whether they're supported by the World Bank or by other organizations. This is a very common problem. Uh, and 
frankly, it's just a matter of uh, talking the talk but not walking the walk. Um, everybody wants to uh, claim to have an allocation formula, but in practice, uh, because it's hard, this allocation formulas are not applied. And this is really an undiscussed issue. Uh, a similar problem is that an allocation formula may be applied during budget formulation, but not during budget execution. So as a result, when grants are actually released, typically by the Ministry of Finance, um, grant releases may not match the formula-based allocation. Uh, similarly, a major problem in many countries are incomplete or untimely disbursements uh, with grants uh, that result in, in uh, very discretionary allocation patterns. So this may be when the central government runs out of money, they may slash um, uh, grants uh, in a way that is uh, not consistent with a formula, or because there's a very complex uh, grant system, it may be that some count, uh, local governments get their resources and others don't. Um, so again, these are obviously major issues, but very uh, unsystematically addressed in, in many countries. Then the third bucket of problems we often see with uh, grants is the use of grant resources at the local level. Um, and this, this relates back to the first point, actually, where we need to define what is the objective of the grant. Uh, and sometimes we're not terribly clear about that, um, especially when we give an unconditional grant. Um, then we have an idea what local government should use that money for, but um, local governments may have different priorities. Uh, so again, to fall back on the Kenya example, um, it may, uh, un a major unconditional grant was provided to the counties to provide all sorts of services and local health spending went down. It may simply be that um, county governments and county governors are not so interested in providing health services. It may be that they're more in providing other services. Um, so uh, that gives us some pause and thought to reflect what it is really that we should achieve and do we have the right systems in place to make sure that local governments spend grant money the way we think it should be spent. Now, uh, sometimes we um, support devolution on a faith-based principle that local governments are governments of the people, by the people, and for the people. But in reality, local leaders are subject to political economy forces and institutional constraints. And if we forget about that and simply assume that local leaders are going to spend their money as per our wishes because our wishes make make good sense somehow, um, we might end up being disappointed. Uh, uh, what we actually have to do is not only ensure that there is active participation and, and inclusive uh, uh, planning and budget processes from the bottom, we also have to make sure that there are uh, solid um, top-down instructions about the use of um, grant resources. Not only instructions, but we need to actually manage and monitor the local use of grant resources, which is a really hard thing to do. Even in high-income countries, monitoring that subnational governments use grant money as per the instructions is a, a difficult and costly activity. Um, and again, most countries I work, uh, this is uh, not done properly. And as a result, um, sometimes uh, money is spent in ways that is inconsistent. Um, that monitoring is often made harder because um, the governance of local government finances often falls between institutional stovepipes, both within government as well as in the donor community. Um, local health spending is an issue of public financial management, it's an issue of local governance, and it's an issue of the sector. Equally, education has uh, different line ministries involved, uh, different donor partner uh, units involved, and so very few countries have a comprehensive view of funding flows to the local government level. Um, and as a result, we end up tend, we tend to set up uh, a numerous parallel reporting systems and monitoring systems. Um, again, this is a, a problem in many countries. And what we fail to do uh, is actually look at um, the disaggregated outcomes at the local level in terms of the development objectives we're trying to pursue. 
Um, so, again, a, a whole bunch of issues where we as a global development community can improve. Uh, some uh, final thoughts, and then I look forward to uh, contributing to a discussion or any, give any further discussion, that many of the um, problems with regard to intergovernmental transfers stem from us not actually analyzing and looking at the funding flows, which we should be able to do. This is an area where, because the government is the one providing the grants, we should be able to monitor spending and funding flows. So um, what we should be able to do is do a better job analyzing what we call the, what we might call the vertical expenditure profile within a sector or within a country, where we look at all spending within a sector, not just central spending, but also local spending. Um, a, re a recent study that we uh, did together with DLOG, the Decentralization and Local Government Donor Partner Working Group, uh, showed that in essentially all countries, services are delivered by a combination of central and local spending. So looking at one without the other simply doesn't make any sense. Um, we can also um, need to do a much better job making sure that budget grant allocations follow the formula and that releases follow the allocation formulas that we stipulate, and that grants are released on a timely and complete basis. And then finally, we need to ensure that the um, uh, uh, local governments spent grant sources as intended. That requires, of course, monitoring of uh, local of, uh, of local spending much more rigorously. And again, these are easy things, to, relatively easy things to do. Um, unfortunately, often we don't do them. So let me leave it at that, and uh, I look forward to your comments and questions. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, please just stay with us. We're going to have the 15 minutes uh, discussion part with uh, Nicoletta. Uh, Nicoletta, can you hear us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry. I have to shout a little bit. Yeah. Um. Is it fine? Yes, it's good. Okay, so... Um, First of all, thank you for, again, also, as Jamie said, for inviting me to participate in this interesting discussion on internal governmental fiscal transfers. Um, uh, for, I mean, uh, my name is Nicoletta Ferullio, and just to tell you a little bit about me, I'm also working at UNICEF as a social and economic analysis specialist at UNICEF. Uh, regional office of the East Asia and Pacific region. Um, so, yeah. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, very much the presenters from the country offices, uh, Joanne and uh, Joanne and Arthur. They really give, uh, gave a comprehensive description of UNICEF engagement and intergovernmental fiscal transfer in their respective countries. And I, won't, I would like also to thank Jamie. Um, actually, his, his presentation uh, provides to all of us, I think, an in, a very good, at the same time, very simple um, analytical framework that can be, I mean, to my knowledge, I mean, very, very useful for UNICEF country office that would like to engage in intergovernmental fiscal transfer. Um, briefly, you see, because of the interest of time, is a bit late here. So, um, when the presenter, especially uh, Joanne and Arthur, they were talking, I tried to took some note, uh, and I would like to highlight. Uh, some points of their presentation that I think uh, might be useful for other UNICEF country offices that are engaging right now 
in intergovernmental fiscal transfer or they would like to engage in the future. Um, talking about uh, the Kenya presentation, uh, Joanne referred to an element that I would like here to stress. Uh, she said that uh, um, lack of good disaggregated data at the local level um, she described that actually as a challenge to influence uh, the equalization grant formula. And uh, according to my experience, and uh, Jamie can compliment me on that, uh, one of the major constraints actually in setting up formula, um, a grant formula, is the availability of data, special availability of data, of course, at the local government level. And when I'm talking about availability of data, I think about uh, data uh, they, are they are coming from uh, <laughs> Then uh, I'm uh, considering the fact that uh, this data, they should be available on consist in a consistent basis, you see, not only for one year. Um, and uh, also this data, they should be available for all subnational governments, for all local governments. And here I think that, uh, for the reason that I choose this, uh, this element of the presentation, I think that here uh, UNICEF can have, uh, can have an advantage, really, um, especially if uh, this mixed data, uh, they use this mixed data, these are available and uh, they are used. I think that this could be, uh, and especially if the mixed data are collected at the level of the local govern government, this, uh, I think, they create um, a good entry point for UNICEF um, in order to exactly to influence uh, hmm, uh, the, um, the, the variables in allocation and also the weights that they are given in the different uh, um, allocations. A second point also that uh, I particularly, I mean, attract my attention in the presentation of the Kenya is also when uh, Joanne mentioned about uh, the 2% of the grant pool that is allocated according to the fiscal discipline. Um, and this, uh, I just uh, want to talk about that because is um, is a creative, let's say, or innovative way to um, define the allocation formula because the, uh, this is what uh, is called a performance criteria that is sometimes also introduced in the allocation of, uh, uh, of a grant. And uh, the idea to introduce this performance criteria, um, there are different, let's say like that there are different purposes um, that uh, push to introduce this uh, performance criteria. One could be that I think it, could, it was the case. I mean, in the in the Kenya context, to offset uh, the possible negative effects of the intergovernmental fiscal transfers on the LG capacity, especially efforts uh, in mobilized on revenue sources. At the same time, and this is the point that I would like to make, it's very interesting to include this performance criteria, this performance variable in uh, in, um, in a formula, because this uh, they act um, as uh, an incentive. They could act as an incentive actually for improve good local service delivery. Also, especially local service delivery, they are very important for children. They are critical for children, as Major was saying before, for example. Um, early child development, if they are, of course, allocated to the um, local governments. Um, these they were the two points, I think, that um, I wanted to stress of, uh, of uh, the Kenya presentation. Um, in relation to the Armenia one, I very much appreciated, actually, the what Arthur said, uh, the integrated approach that actually Armenia country office used to embark in intergovernmental fiscal transfer. So from one side, it's true they were working, you know, they are trying to advocate to influence the allocation formula, the equalization grant formula. From the other side, they were trying to work with the World Bank 
for in order to transform this uh, social investment fund, I think I believe in a capital development grant. And then at the same time, they were working on, uh, um, let's say, local service planning, so in a PFM, a subnational level. And this is very important, I think, for all country offices. They want to embark in intergovernmental fiscal transfer. Be you need to focus, uh, I think, what all, all of us, if we want to engage, we need to focus on both intergovernmental aspects. So, okay, we look at the formula. But at the same time, a UNICEF country office, they should also look at the local government specific reforms aspect. Because the transfer are, yes, necessary, but are not sufficient conditions, I think, for effective service delivery, especially for the delivery of the services that are critical for children. And so it's interesting what Armenia did, okay? They are working on the transfer, but at the same time, they got involved in other elements. There are exactly local government-specific reform. They got involved in public financial management, because once you transfer the money to the local government, it's very important that the local government are capable to use, to plan, and then to use and to execute these transfers, first for the purpose that this transfer was intended for, is what the objective that Jamie was talking about. And then they have to use this money in an efficient and effective way, to the advantage, of course, of the children. A second also element or second aspect that I think local governors, they should work in parallel while working in intergovernmental fiscal transfer is in social accountability. It's very important to um, create this mechanism for citizens to be able to participate and especially to um, articulate their preferences in the planning phase, especially in that case when you are working in general purpose grants. Um, this is one point, I think. This integrated approach is very, is particularly relevant, I think, for UNICEF. Um, and I also like very much in the Armenia, and I will, I, I would like to use what uh, Arthur said, actually, because what I think they did, um, they didn't only work on the equalization, but they look at the whole structure of the transfer system. What I mean with that is that, yeah, it is important to work on the revision or on the definition of the formula that is appropriate. At the same time, um, they not only did that, because, uh, correct me out if I'm wrong, but I think the equalization grant in Armenia is mainly meant for recurrent expenditure. So they were working on this, but in order to put this local government um, in a position to really deliver services for children, they also work with the World Bank in order to provide capital grants. So an incredible good combination, I think, between the recurrent expenditure they were funding through an equalization grant, at the same time they work in the, with the World Bank in order also to, um, to get to the local government some capital grants for infrastructures. So I think this is also an important element. When UNICEF engaged in intergovernmental fiscal transfer should consider not only not only focusing I mean on the formula, but yes to consider the whole structure of the transfer system. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Jamie, are you there? Yes. Yeah, um, to add any comments. If I could add a add a few comments, um, in my my presentation, or I already made some links to the the previous. Uh, one one or two comments um, that I'd like to make, or things to to point out that may be relevant for many of the other uh, country offices as well. Um, is is perhaps not to focus too much on the form allocation formula. Um, for example, and, and it, this came up in the Armenia case, including the number of children in an allocation formula itself does very little. Um, in most countries, the number of children per local government are roughly proportionate 
to the number of adults uh, or people overall in, in different local governments. So just including children in the formula um, may make one proud, but it doesn't necessarily um, uh, result in, in any better services for children. It is really what you do with the money. Um, so equally on that point, uh, for example, if you're able to do what, what uh, has been done in Armenia by uh, kind of leveraging uh, a social action fund or a territorial development fund, um, then you might put some conditions on, on these grants and say require local governments to spend this in a pro-child manner. I don't want to embarrass the specific country where this has been tried. This, this was done in South Asia. Um, uh, and there was a requirement, and I forget the exact percentage, that something like 20 or 30 percent of a local development fund was supposed to be spent on, on services benefiting children. And what ended up happening is um, that local governments would build a kilometer of road and say one third of that road was for children. Um, I don't think that was the intention of, of uh, the requirement. But without monitoring and more more careful guidance on what the money is for, those things happen. Um, so it, it's uh, we have to often go beyond um, a simple kind of approach by giving in simple instructions or simply including children in the formula. We will not necessarily achieve our policy objectives. I do think, and I'd like uh, like to pick up on one point that like Nicoletta mentioned, and that was that there might be a particular niche for UNICEF in monitoring local conditions. One of the big surprises, I think, of the post-2015 debate is if you think about development outcomes, such as whether it is literacy or infant mortality under five health outcomes or other um, uh, san sanitation outcomes or other issues that are of concern for development in children in particular, um, what do we know about these problems at the local level? Uh, not only do we need disaggregated data for the design of transfers, but we also want to monitor the impact, whether or not the funding that we put down there has an impact. Um, in the, the low-income countries in Africa and Asia where I work, the situation is a little bit better in, in Eastern Europe and, and uh, former Soviet Union, but particularly in Africa and Asia, I cannot readily think of a country where the data about health outcomes or education outcomes or sanitation outcomes is available from an authoritative source at the local level. So that disaggregated data is simply not available which means that we're trying to address development challenges, but we actually don't know where those challenges take place, in which local government or in which part of the country. So we really need better data, not just for the design of transfers, but um, so that we know whether or not we're succeeding and whether or not we're targeting our money right. Um, so I, and I do think that UNICEF there would have a, um, a distinct advantage uh, in terms of its reputation. Uh, now, it, this may sound as a very technical exercise, actually, but simply collecting and presenting data at the local level on outcomes will become very, very political very quickly. Um, so it is important to have someone like UNICEF advocating for that. Um, on performance criteria, I just wanted to touch briefly on that uh, in response to, again, comments made earlier. Um, performance grants can be a very effective tool, but they also are a little bit of a double-edged sword because um, it is indeed possible to design grants to ensure that there is a positive impact on local governance or other local service delivery practices, but they're often not well designed. So actually designing a good performance grant is quite hard and you have to be very careful. I just want to throw that caution in. Um, and if I look, uh, I have to uh, give the disclaimer that I, I work with the UN system, with the World Bank, as well as with other bilateral development agencies, but even having contributed to a number of performance-based grants, um, uh, they don't often, they don't always achieve what they set out to achieve. So there is a need to be cautious with them. Let me leave my comments at that. Uh, thank you, Jim. So in this part, we're going to have the Q&A session, uh, and uh, Maria 
will uh, facilitate the conversation. question you can uh, type it in uh, right now um, I think we can try to address uh, uh, three questions per presenter um, I received already a few uh, questions for the Armenia uh, country office so Arthur if you're there um, I will read the presentation the questions right now and then maybe you can uh, respond to them uh, the first question was uh, how did you get the buy-in of the World Bank uh, uh, in the projects with the LSP? Um, the second question was, uh, children are now included as a variable, and what has convinced the government to include children, and has this made any difference? Uh, then there was a question about uh, uh, to hear more about the evolution of the Social Investment Fund. And finally, uh, how did you position this work in relation to what other UN agencies are doing? So perhaps uh, you can uh, address these questions. Uh, okay, can you hear me, Mariah? Uh, yeah. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to elaborate one by one. Uh, Archer, did you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Ah, okay, okay. I can continue. Um, well, I'll try to I'll try to elaborate one by one. Um, uh, World Bank related. I think it was a. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, it was a joint initiative. So throughout the reform of integrated social services. Uh, we partnered with uh, with the bank around uh, all the pillars of the reform: uh, case management, one window reception, and local social planning. So in, it it appeared that the bank is a natural partner. So when the idea of financing for local social planning uh, appeared, and we learned that the bank's plan is to transform the social assistance fund into the territorial development plan, it immediately resonates that indeed it it, it is exactly the um, the plan that we were uh, uh, that we were thinking uh, from the onset. So we did a bottleneck analysis before that, and we identified that the key problem for the local social planning is the predictability. So, despite the fact that the planning as a, the local social planning as an instrument was institutionalized, so the key problem for the, for for this instrument was the predictability issue. And the banks, we, we, we supported the bank's approach because by, by transforming the assistant fund, uh, it, it, we immediately created the, um, a pool of money and uh, we supported the process even before by introducing the database. And that's where I want to support Nicoletta's point that our very initial involvement in the Territorial Development Fund was the data system. So the, the, the data system for the Territorial Development bank is coming from so-called community database and UNICEF supported a lot with the UNDP the quality of this administrative data system which is based on the uh, on the um, human uh, adjusted human development index uh, which takes a lot uh, about uh, access to services uh, and mostly social sector services so that was our primary niche uh, in terms of local social planning, there was a question about that one. I think the the key innovation uh, in relation to local social planning is that it brings uh, uh, additional layers to the planning. So in addition to sectoral planning that we have now in the country, so the health, education, and social protection is, uh, uh, is uh, designed separately, we introduced a social group-based planning where well, children uh, and specific disadvantaged group of children are presented as a separate ca category. So it comes to supplement the, the, the sectoral planning because the diagnosis was that uh, the sectoral planning in many cases neglects uh, the needs of children. So sector-based sector approaches uh, do not properly respond, but in many cases they, they are not uh, even able to properly determine the problems because the problem may appear in one sector, but the, respo the response should come from another sector. Um, 
Referring to the to the criteria that the children as a percentage point, uh, yes, Jamie, I think you are right that uh, having children as a separate criteria is 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 not the perfect solution. But I think uh, in our case we have many communities where predominant uh, where mostly. Uh, uh, elderly live and other uh, categories uh, dominate. These are small communities. So from our perspective, uh, there was a, there was a necessity to introduce this specific, uh, this specific criteria to differentiate and to reserve the money where the, uh, uh, for, for the communities where have uh, more potential for child related, um, uh, services. Uh, what we also learned, that, and I think uh, I'm responding now to the question of public finance management uh, analysis that we conducted, uh, there are some interesting nitty-gritties of the process, uh, and thanks to this study. Uh, I mean, the inertia of budgeting process and the, the, the close tie to the cost centers uh, created uh, some unfavorable environment for, for children. I mean, if the services are already existing, then the budget flows are more or less coming. But for the new ones, and this especially applies to the alternative uh, childcare services, there are, there are few chances uh, because of this budgeting inertia process. So for us, it was uh, critical to understand uh, this type of um, phenomena like uh, budgeting inertia in order to properly um, advise the government. And lastly, I think I don't miss anything in terms of UNDAF uh, and uh, alliances with UN, uh, UN partners. Yes, there was a partnership with UNDP uh, in relation to the data system uh, for the Territorial Development Fund, but uh, I think it was quite limited. And uh, UNDAF-wise, I think uh, all the elements that I'm presenting are framed as part of the local social planning initiative and integrated social reform. So um, most of the UN agencies uh, are not very active uh, in the area of decentralization and intergovernmental fin fiscal transfers, while other donors in this specific momentum, like GIZ and the World Bank, are quite adequate. I think I'll stop here, not to overspend my time. Thanks. Thank you, Arthur. Um, just two more brief questions. Um, there was one question uh, that Nicoletta uh, already uh, referred to, but maybe Jamie can also provide some feedback on this. Uh, how do you suggest we track and monitor the allocation and expenditures um, uh, on a local level? Um, and the second uh, question, uh, also I think for Jamie, is that including children in the formula may not uh, reach the final objective. However, isn't it a good first step? Uh, please, if you have any feedback on this. Super, thank you. Um, those are really two challenging issues. First, let me um, briefly touch on, on the um, on the question about does it make sense to include children in the formula. Um, uh, and I'd like a good economist, the answer of course is it depends. Um, one, one thing, one practice I believe you should avoid is just adding the number of children in a formula without linking it specifically to services or infrastructure for children. If the local government, say if you have a village development fund where the purpose of the village development fund is build essentially economic infrastructure, adding children to the formula may not make any sense and that results in in the uh, in road resources being uh, you know uh, spent on roads and then designated as pro child. What is a good practice, I think, in terms of transfer design is linking uh, the funding to specific functions. So we call that finance should follow function. So for example, if you intend local governments to set aside a certain share of their budget on, say, kindergarten education or other pro, you know, uh, specific uh, services, then it makes a lot of sense to include the number of children or the number of school age children or the number of under five children in the formula. But then, of course, you have to follow up and specifically articulate how the resources, say, per child should actually be translated into services. So it's a, uh, Arthur is correct that there are definitely ways in which this can be done meaningfully, uh, and I don't mean to say, uh, to diminish that, um, but it, it needs to be not just in the formula, but really it needs to link, finance should link to function. Um, 
On the monitoring issue, um, this is a, a major challenge, I think, in many countries. Um, in terms of monitoring uh, uh, the financial flows, I would actually recommend uh, monitoring from all angles. Uh, so typically, the tre of course, the Treasury knows how much they release to local governments. Let them make that public. Very few ministries of finance actually make public the disbursements that they make to local governments. But then also ask local governments to report how much they receive from the central government in terms of transfers. Because ideally, those two numbers should match. Um, and you'd be surprised if you try this in a country that very seldom do these numbers actually exactly match. And unless you have both both these figures in terms of the financing flows, you won't actually know what's really going on and money may end up disappearing uh, unintentionally. Um, the other challenge that I raised was actually the, the, the monitoring of outcomes uh, in terms of under five mortality literacy disaggregated at the local level. And that is again, I, I, Brazil has actually an excellent, does an excellent job monitoring uh, MDG outcomes at the municipal level. They have a website that provides you for every municipality uh, where the municipality contributes its data um, and you can access that data through one mechanism. Uh, but again, I, I would like to remind you that data can become very political. So exactly who makes it available and how um, is very important. If you put a central government in charge of making local government data available, you will find that they will have their own motivations for doing it or not doing it or not doing it in a timely manner. So there is some good experience uh, 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 in this regard. I think South Africa does a very good job. Um, uh, certainly is a country that Kenya should be looking at, I think, more than it already does. Uh, for transparency and, and these systems issues. Um, but so there is good experience out there, but at the same time, it goes wrong in many, many countries. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, if there is not any other questions, comments, uh, I guess we should uh, conclude the session here. And uh, thanks again uh, for your participation and for your time. And uh, we will post uh, the recording of this session on the PF4C Committee of Practice, as well as all the uh, PowerPoint presentations. And uh, let us know if you have any questions, comments. And uh, we will also, also share the technical notes uh, by uh, end of the month. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, have a great uh, rest of the day.